We're here at Brandeis University, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, in the lab of Dr. Irene Pepperberg and her parrot, Griffin. Dr. Pepperberg and the parrot, Alex, became famous some years ago because she began to show that animals have a lot more on their minds than we might have thought and raised all kinds of new questions about consciousness. Was he here the night that Alex died? Oh, yeah. This is the, the lab hasn't changed at all in the intervening 18 months or so. Did Griffin understand something from the night that Alex died? Well, he misses Alex. I don't know what he understands or doesn't in terms of death, but he understands that Alex is not here. He would look towards Alex's cage for a very long time. Even now, sometimes when we do sessions that are a little tough, he'll look towards Alex's cage because Alex would normally interrupt and provide the right answer for him. Corner. You're right, Alex. Good boy. Well, you don't get a nut. He answered the question. <laughs> so, you know, something's there, but I don't. I would hesitate to say that it was like ours. You've been working with parrots for 32 years. That's correct. Why did you choose parrots? You wanted to understand animal intelligence, but why parrots? Because they talk. What's here? What's the matter? Court. That's a good parrot, Alex. What do you think was the key contribution and addition that you've added to the science of our understanding of what intelligence is in your work with Alex and Griffin and the others? Well, the idea that just the overall size of a brain is not important, that creatures with tiny little brains, but as long as those brain areas are large relative to the rest of the, the body and the, those cortical-like areas work the way ours do. And Alex or Griffin, they're what both color? African gray parrots. What color is Their brains are the size of shell walnuts. You know, what color? What color is k? What color? What color is k? Good parrot, Alex. Good boy. How does play, if it does, get involved in your teaching, your learning, uh, in the life of your relationship with these animals and what, what you've learned about orange. how they think? Well, we hope that they look at what the training as a form of play, okay? Because it has to be fun or interesting or they won't cooperate. And you certainly know that the more fun you make a task, the more eager individuals are willing to engage in the task. Evolution has made it fun for us to learn, and that makes a lot of sense because learning is obviously adaptive and makes it more likely you're going to survive and pass on your genes. Yeah. What do you want? What do you want? Tell me. You have to tell me. I'm not going to just do it. You have to tell me. Yes, you have to tell me. All right, then you just sit here until you tell me. <laughs> Training. Want to go back? Want to go back. Okay. <laughs> Good boy. <laughs> what just happened there? He, he was using his body language to tell me he wanted to go back to the cage. But in this lab, you don't just use body language, you speak. And so I waited until he actually would tell me what he wanted. I think the issue is that these birds have some level of consciousness. It may not be identical to our consciousness, but it's there. Can I prove it? No. Can I give you anecdotes that suggest that these birds are conscious, like the nut? story. So we put out the tray that we normally use. It has refrigerator letters on it, the same things that little children have. So plastic letters are different colors. And the routine is, you know, what color or what sound is blue. So we started doing a few of these things with Alex and he can get whatever he wants as a reward. So he was asking this time for a nut. Finally, after about the five or sixth trial, he turns around and he looks at me and says, want a nut? N -a -t. And I, it, was, it was striking for two reasons. One was the sort of, you know, hey, stupid, do I have to spell it for you, of course. But the scientifically interesting reason was that n and t were on the tray, but uh had never been trained. So that he had jumped ahead of us and had figured out, you know, n, uh, t. That was how he was going to get his nut. Alex knew what was coming next, so to speak and figured out some way of manipulating me to get what he wanted. What matter? Rock, good birdie. What toy? What toy? Ring, good birdie. How many corners? How many corners? How many corners? No, how many corners? Nice and clear. How many corners? 
I know this is hard. This is what we're working and working on. How many corners? How many corners? How many corners? Here, give you a little clip. How many corners? How many corners? Good birdie. Good boy. Good birdie. You need a little hint there, huh? Okay. We realize that there is a continuum. We should realize there is a continuum. I mean that, that we are a part of nature, not a part from nature. A, a continuum back through our evolutionary history? Yes, but in terms of our abilities as of today. I mean, there's a continuum of what animals are doing and what we are doing. And a lot of overlap. A lot of overlap. What does conscious mean? Self-reflective? It's or? a self-reflection. It's not just being aware of the world. We know they're aware of the world. I mean, how could he report that this is green and this is blue? When you talk about actual consciousness, you're talking about the idea of being in your mind saying, oh, I know that this is red, green, and blue, and I can, you know, think about what I want to do with that knowledge. Reflecting on your own reflecting. Exactly. There's obviously something in, you know, in that skull that is processing information in ways that are very similar to the way you and I are processing information. He's a sentient being. He may not think exactly the way we do. His consciousness may not be exactly that of our consciousness, but he certainly has something there. And, you know, my job is to try to see what it is and look at the differences and similarities. And there are going to be differences, of course, too. But that's my job.